Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining and thank you for um, coming in for uh, two great pitches that we have ahead of us. I think um, my name is Elizabeth Dickinson. I'm associate editor at DevX. Um, and I have the very difficult job of filling the shoes of Raj Kumar, our CEO, who was here this morning. Um, my remit with DevX, we are a social enterprise and also a media company. Um, I follow the Middle East and Africa particularly, as well as our humanitarian coverage. Um, so part of my job really is, is sort of finding, uh, listening to pitches throughout the real world, uh, throughout the real world and, and thinking about these issues on a daily basis. It's such an honor and a pleasure now to hear about them in person, about some of the newest innovations and also some of the most exciting initiatives that are happening. Um, I think if there's a lesson from this morning, it's that, of course, there is no silver bullet in education, but it, it's, it's really everything. And every piece of that puzzle is very important. And we're going to hear about two very important aspects of that this afternoon. Um, we have three great judges with us this afternoon as well to offer feedback. Uh, we have Nick Booth, the CEO of the Royal Foundation of Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Uh, we have Irina Angelinescu from the Southeast, Southeastern European Private Equity and VC Association. And finally, we have Hassan Al Damluji from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So really, who could ask for a better panel of judges? And I want to give the floor now to Andrew Cunningham from the Aga, Aga Khan Foundation to set us off. Thanks so much. Thanks. Good afternoon. Excellent, excellent. Uh, this will be the best session of the day. Uh, we have two New Englanders in the house. We have Amy and myself, and we're happy to be here in Dubai. My name is Andrew Cunningham, and I'm the Global Education Officer for the Aga Khan Foundation based in Geneva, Switzerland at our headquarters. And I have the privilege of giving you a bit of a journey of our particular interest in measuring what we care about in quality education. And this is a journey that is in progress. And I want to pitch to our panel of esteemed judges and our audience of esteemed experts a new product and process called Promise, the Program Management Information System for Education by Everyone Everywhere, or E-Cubed, if you will. So first, I'm going to give you a journey in five different parts. And uh, if, the, uh, if the machine can start working, that'd be really, really helpful um, as we tick down. This is the suspense that we're building. So we'll be doing in five different parts. Um, first is who we are. Second is the problem that we are facing in terms of measuring what we care about in quality education. We then will go through our solution, our proposed plan, and then offer a few insights for discussion and feedback from the panel. So first is who we are. 60 years ago, His Highness the Aga Khan launched the Aga Khan Development Network, which is a sister or a, a series of sister agencies, 11 interrelated agencies dedicated to promoting economic development, social development, and cultural and heritage around the world, strengthening institutions and delivering essential services to hundreds of millions of people. Five of our agencies are dedicated to education, whether that be our private academies or our Aga Khan Education Services, which serve primary and secondary education levels, or our universities, Aga Khan University in Eastern Africa or Central or University of Central Asia in Central Asia, we as the foundation leverage the insights and the innovations from our private institutions in long-term collaborations with governments, whether that be governments at a local level, a national level, or an international level. And what makes us different is that we are driving towards a collective goal in the hardest to reach locations around the world. We are present in 16 countries throughout the Middle East, throughout Asia, and throughout Africa. And our driving goal that binds our five permanent agencies dedicated to education is a very inspiring message from His Highness the Aga Khan. To equip students, not just with the knowledge and skills, but also with the attitudes and values to become engaging members of the world and become contributing members of a pluralistic society. And when we think about our investments, we believe that investing in education will fulfill the other 17 sustainable development goals. What makes us different is that we also think in 25 to 50 year increments. We will be there for the long term. We will outlast political cycles, but we will support political actors in the civil society sector all the way to the government sector, 
combining and leveraging our collective experience from the classroom to also our family of donors around the world. So what is our problem? It's very difficult to measure such a diverse portfolio of programs in such a wide variety of contexts. And a year and a half ago, this was our data management system. It was very difficult to analyze a very simple question. How many students are we reaching? And multiple, multiple times, this is the answer that we received. So we said, how could we leverage different technologies to at least increase and improve our ability to have a bit of data literacy for measuring our impact? So we had a one-two punch. First, we said, let's partner with the leading customer relationship management software in the world, Salesforce. They're trusted by Fortune 500 companies around the world. Why not the education sector? How could we leverage their experience and their global footprint in helping us understand what matters in education? However, within our organization, we are not techies. I may be dressed like a techie today, but we are not techies. I am an education professional. So we need an intermediary. So we chose Vera Solutions, almost in the sense that if you picture a car, that's Salesforce. The driver is Vera Solutions, and we are the passengers telling where the driver to go. They are the ones that are helping us translate the multitude of opportunities that Salesforce provides in trying to understand what our local realities need in terms of measuring quality education. And they also have a global footprint. They work across 170 different organizations, some in the most rural and some in the most urban slums that you've ever seen in, in your life. So we trust them, and they are basically transforming our organization. So within a year, starting from uh, January of 2016, they helped us develop the first four concentric circles helping us measure our global indicators, our global education indicators, national education system indicators, and district education system indicators. So rather than have an Excel-based data management process, we have a dynamic data dashboard entry system, which we piloted throughout our 16 country programs. The people are what make the product, not the product that makes the people. And you can tell from our collective and inspiring goal that we are driving the technology rather than the other way around. And you can see that we finally are able to visualize and compare across our different country programs and within our country programs, again, what matters in education. But for us, that wasn't enough. We said, could we go one level deeper? Could we get to the school, classroom, and student level to enable school leaders and teachers to do this type of data management and analysis themselves? And we were inspired by a very simple bottle, Coca-Cola. I spent three and a half years of my life living and working out of a mud hut in rural Kenya. And many around the room know that you can always get a bottle of cold Coke, or maybe not so cold, but a bottle of Coke in many of the villages where we work. And Coca-Cola understands when a bottle is consumed and when the supply chain needs, supply chain needs to respond to that consumed Coke. In the education sector, we still are struggling with three basic questions. Are our kids coming to school? Are our children staying and transitioning in school? And are our children learning? If Coca-Cola can understand to the most remote areas their supply chain, why can't the education sector? And when you understand Coca-Cola's and, and a number of other Fortune 500 companies' data management system, many of them are leveraging the technology and the expertise of Salesforce.com or other customer relationship management software. So enter our solution, the promise, promise three. Well, we needed money to do that. And I'm not here just to pitch money. I'm here to pitch actually a collaboration in partnership with us. Because we were fortunate enough to go to Salesforce.org and say we would like to get down to that school, classroom, and student level. And we pitched a Force for Change grant. And out of 750 global applicants, we were selected as one of six in January, in which we received $390,000. An incredible opportunity for us to look at how 
the Sustainable Development Goal Global Community, this is how they claim to measure Sustainable Development 4. Sustainable Development Goal 4. They see it as global indicators, regional, thematic, national. Do you remember those concentric circles? Where is that school circle? Where is that opportunity for a school leader and a teacher to measure their own levels of quality? In other words, how can Promise help us transform existing school data collection tools and analyses? These are pictures taken from three weeks ago at Quali Primary in Kenya. Because from this grant from Salesforce, for the next basically three to six months, we are asking teachers across different countries and school leaders how you already answered these three basic questions. And we are finding that there is a number of sophisticated analyses. You go into many different schools, and this is unsurprising to many in the room, they know how to make analysis. But unfortunately, they are an island by themselves. They lack the tools to compare and contrast within and across schools. And in this particular school, what was very striking when we talked to the head teacher, she said, I can somehow manage measuring attendance. I can somehow manage measuring enrollment. But how do I measure my school motto? How do I measure my school values? Which I think also speaks to this year's theme of global citizenship education. Our priorities as a foundation of promoting pluralism in and through education also resonated in that question. And finally, how can we transform the existing realities of local and global education data management into actionable feedback cycles to improve schools and communities, to enable them to understand where they are strong and where they have opportunities to grow? So our plan. Over the next 12 months, we are being incredibly ambitious. And we are already in our third month. Remember, this was a pitch about partnership. So this is a pitch about joining our journey right at the best time. So if you can see, for the last three months, we've been going to our pilot countries and asking questions from teachers and head teachers in classrooms, in local communities, rather than design this from Geneva, Switzerland, or elsewhere, or San Francisco, where Salesforce is. Then, for the next three months, we are designing and prototyping with Vera Solutions and Salesforce to then go back to the same schools we were interviewing to pilot this technology. The vision for this technology is a mobile app that can be customized based on country and customized based on the school-specific needs of what they want to measure. But we don't know that until we ask them. And that's been a core value of the Aga Khan Foundation globally and actually at the heart of our success. We simply listen for a very long time and start partnering and acting alongside our partners. In one of our data collection uh, experiences, this was from Bangladesh, we asked them to do a data flow. And this represents a common reoccurring theme. From the student, it's very clear how the information gets to the Aga Khan Foundation. But then there's a black box of getting back to the student. And this is recurring over and over and over again. So how do we understand from different perspectives what are the main challenges for data collection analysis and use? And you can see here our different uh, consultations across eight countries. Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Syria, Bangladesh, India, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. All of whom I've met in the last two months in a quite extraordinary journey. And my colleague in the, in the audience, Nafisa Shakova, was also had the privilege of being with me. So where does this leave us? I'm asking the panel to consider three insights and the opportunity to partner with us in expanding our pilots into different countries. If we can leverage $390,000 and do pilots across eight countries to release a global app um, that will be downloadable uh, through the Salesforce App Exchange, that is a huge opportunity to tackle one of the hardest questions that we have. Why do we care about what we can measure rather than measure what we care about? So I leave you with three insights. How do we generate more meaningful data feedback loops across and within schools? Rather than jump to national and international education management information systems, how do we understand within a school their processes of data collection, data storage, which you saw a semi, uh, I would 
a troubling environment for storing the data. But the getting beyond the bottleneck of analysis and dissemination. And that's where the leveraging of the mobile app really could come into play. And there is incredible enthusiasm in each classroom that we visit. Second, how could we relocate the digital revolution from the top down to bottom up? There are many innovations. There are many new shiny objects. How do we listen and engage with local actors in utilizing technology for their needs? And finally, how do we bridge the data silos and begin to develop more holistic approaches to improving quality education? Which brings us back to the beginning. His Highness has said there is no better investment that individuals, parents, and the nation can make than an investment in education. For us, it's been a privilege to be here, to share our journey. As you can tell, we're only three months into it, but it's building off a year and a half of innovative partnerships with Vera Solutions and Salesforce, and building on 60 years of community partnership around the world. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great presentation. I, I really enjoy how you both draw, in, uh, draw lessons from a number of different sectors and then also build on what's already there so you're not sort of reinventing the wheel. Um, I want to turn right to our panel of judges for their feedback. Uh, so Nick, would you like to begin? Andrew, thank you. Well done. Very articulate, very passionate. I thought you did a brilliant job in making data and IT interesting, <laughs> uh, which is not always easy. Um, my only slight constructive feedback was this, there was a load of stuff on the slides. Yeah. So actually, it's pretty hard to see them from here yeah. um, and to follow the pace you were going at when I actually wanted to sit. And I'm not as smart as you, so I couldn't keep up. Um, <laughs> so you might want to think about that yeah, just in terms great. of helping people follow along. Um, and I've probably got lots of questions about our shared experience of working for very well-known people and how you're funded. But it might be a bit niche for the general audience in terms of uh, royals and royal highnesses and his highnesses. So I'll keep off that, um, although it is an interesting one when people assume you have lots of money and you don't right. necessarily, which I'm exactly. sure is a shared experience. Um, I, I did want to drill down a little bit into the, the local delivery element, which I wasn't clear about. So you've got a plan to move into a number of different countries, and I wasn't quite sure how you were going to do that from a centralized position or whether there are local delivery partners. And I guess related to that, in a former life of mine, I was um, at a senior role at Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, and we spent a lot of time and effort trying to get into school districts, trying to get them to share data in order that we can track progress and they're not always willing or in some cases even allowed to do that because of local protocols and so on and I suspect multiply that complexity times X in different countries around the world. So there's a sort of related how are you going to deliver it locally um, and then what process are you going to go through to make sure that people are willing to share that data. Great. Should I, should I just address that now? Nick, thank you so much. 98% um, of the Aga Khan Foundation staff live in the communities where we work. So in terms of delivery, it's actually leveraging the community's trust that we have developed over decades. So the schools in which we are piloting are schools that we've partnered with for years and that are already providing data into our organizational data management system. The question that we want to pose through Promise, Promise 3, is that how can teachers and school leaders lead their own data management process rather than feeding up for either monitoring and evaluation purposes or report uh, requirements for, for particular donors or our own internal funding support. Uh, so in terms of the delivery, this particular year we're keeping it very manageable. So in each one of the pilot countries, we're only partnering with four schools. The reason why is because at each school when we visit, it takes us four and a half to five hours to go through the different stakeholders and asking what types of uh, existing information do you have around these three questions. So for example, how do you know that children are coming to school? They'll say, well, we have enrollment. Well, show me that. They show us the, the registrar book. And then they go on to opening up a cabinet. And they slam folder after folder after folder of t mountains of data. You saw a little bit of that. And unfortunately, one of our head teachers said, I have no idea if the student who came in my register book has completed all eight years of education. And globally, when you think about that question, our statistics of completion rates are based on numbers in classrooms rather than student tracking. That type of lack of clarity is really alarming for us as an organization dedicated to the long-term development of countries. 
So in each one of these, each one of these four, four schools per country, we ask the head teacher a series of questions, a focus group of teachers, a focus group of parents, usually they're, they're the school management committee board members, and then we ask seventh and eighth grade children. And many times we find out a lot more from the final group in the sense of, well, how do you know that kids are not in school? Well, they're actually over there by the, by, by the fruit tree, but you know, Mrs. Amina never checks over there. I mean, there's that kind of insight and that kind of detail that is required in an iterative co-design process. So with each one of those four schools per country, we will roll out the prototype for feedback. Will they, just final question, will they have to pay their own licensing and ongoing management of the database? So in this first year, because we're a Force for Change grant winner, all of the licenses are, are, are free and in kind. Um, we have to be in negotiation with Salesforce as an organization, and we're actually in the midst of it, of how we as an international development organization could help leverage our reach in different countries and also support the great products that Salesforce has, but at a much more affordable cost for the communities in which we work. And when you think about it, I mean, I, I'll be very honest, I never heard of Salesforce until two years ago. And I went to their Dreamforce conference. This conference is tremendous because we have really nice sunshine. So they have theirs in San Francisco, also really nice sunshine, but they have 170,000 people across seven different hotels. It's overwhelming to think about how much expertise and resources are put into their software. So I imagine that there's an opportunity for actually, because they're dedicated to actually doing sustainable development goals. This is an opportunity, I think, for partnership and negotiation. Um, so ongoing costs for organizationally, yes, per country, but per school, that's still in negotiation right now. Andrew, fantastic presentation. Uh, you followed all the rules in the book for a pitch. Um, the, the rule. You structured it properly. Um, your enthusiasm shows and it, uh, it's contagious. Um, because I was um, about to ask the same question that Nick asked and I really loved your answer, my suggestion would be, if possible, to think about uh, a little bit of storytelling. So if you can, I don't know, show a picture of that student who, whose story is not traced, um, maybe adding a little bit of uh, individual emotion, because you know numbers, we, we had a presentation earlier which was lacking numbers. Yours is uh, putting the right emphasis on numbers, but maybe you know just the story of one kid, especially since I'm pretty sure you have lots of inspiring stories, uh, might be, might be a, a good idea. Um, I think, it's the right time to focus on data. Uh, I think you are very well positioned to be a significant player in this space and I want to congratulate you for this initiative. Um, two questions. The first one, how many people on your team are working on this particular project this year? So at our Geneva level, we are a very lean team. So that's our headquarters for technical. So there are only five education officers actually in Geneva, including our director. So there are three of us that are really full time on it plus our director of global lead, sorry, of knowledge management. Um, so our monitoring evaluation, evaluation, research, and learning. If you saw the concentric circles, all of our different sectors, civil society, rural development, health, are going through a similar process that we went through for our global education management information system. So technically, almost everyone in our global office are thinking about how they're improving their data management and leveraging the lessons learned from our initial year and a half partnership in terms of promise three, I would, in addition to the three education folks, we have also in our 16 countries, the kind of buy-in and the kind of enthusiasm from our local education officers. Um, particularly in the eight countries that we're piloting in, uh, they are also partnering with the school leaders and the local government officials. Um, and they're coming back with information that frankly is missing in this discourse of local realities actually pushing back of, could we measure this type of data, but for it not to go globally? Could we have the tools within our school to manage some of the questions without raising alarm bells every time we say that maybe our enrollment has dipped a little bit? I mean, that kind of dialogue is missing in a data discourse, in, in our opinion. Thank you. And the second question would be, in this process, which involves a lot of design thinking, and basically you have to collect all this information, what was the biggest revelation that you had by discussing to the, to, to, to the partners, with the partner schools? What was something that changed your way of thinking during the design process? Thanks for the question. I, I did have a, a picture of the Egyptian pyramids um, in the presentation, and at the last minute I said, that's just too much to explain within 12 minutes. So I appreciate the opportunity to explain that now. 
it came from that head teacher who was actually slamming the books down and looking at the register and understanding that, in fact, our global statistics do not reflect an individual tracking. We have no idea if Amina, who comes in, if she actually transitions through the grades, even at a school level. That particular responsibility of fulfilling the right to education, the head teacher said, I'm failing that right. I'm failing her right. The plea from the head teacher for a particular process to supplement what she and her colleagues are doing on a daily basis to understand if Amina reaches all the way is a plea that I think could be multiplied across many different schools around the world. And frankly, again, going back to other sectors, if other sectors have figured out the supply and demand equation, I'm, I'm, constantly, um, I'm constantly frustrated that in the public sector, we're always a bit slower in that regard. I understand because of privacy and security issues. I understand because of cost and also personnel. But I, what I hope is that we are actually at a point where we are combining the technological advances the affordability of those advances in the context in which we work, and frankly, the will of our particular stakeholders of changing the way, not only measuring quality, but actually improving it. Um, so I think, I think that's the, that was the biggest revelation of this, this metaphorical pyramid of that we know everyone coming in at the base, but we have no idea, and it's a diminishing population once they get to eighth grade in many of our communities. So thanks very much. Um, you are a fantastic presenter. You're a confident presenter. And as was already mentioned, you, you bring to us a lot of the passion that you feel. Um, but I don't think that anyone's here just to hear niceties so, or pleasantries. Uh, I think the point of this session is to actually say what normally in a pitch you'd be thinking and yes. wouldn't necessarily exactly. give us feedback. So I'm going to be a little bit mean. Great. Um, there are a few things missing that would prevent me from investing in this based purely on the pitch. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, data is really important. So, you know, you, you've got allies here on that principle. But I think a lot of money is wasted um, based on that initial uh, hypothesis uh, or fact um, when it's not translated into impact. And what I didn't hear really from you, mm -hmm. although I'm starting to hear it, but I still am looking mm -hmm. for you to go that one stage further in your responses to questions mm -hmm. is how is this going to impact mm -hmm. the students learning more? And frankly, if, it's, if that's not there, then mm -hmm. I wouldn't put a single dollar in it. Now, I believe you have the answer to that question. What you're telling me is you don't know if Amina, who starts age five or whatever age, graduates. Mm -hmm. What I then want to hear is you say, if I can track her through schooling, mm -hmm. I can work out much more precisely mm -hmm. if she fails, why she fails, if she succeeds, why she succeeds. Mm -hmm. And that will then make me change what I do on a daily basis, and that's going to have impact. And that story's not there. That's the value of data. It's not just, you know, you, you stopped at saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if we knew? Mm. Uh, maybe it would, or maybe $390,000 is too much to pay just for that knowledge. And so that's what I think um, you need. Mm. Uh, I really like the long-term thinking part of it, and I like the fact that you came along saying, it's not like I need your cash. I do need your cash, but this is a collaboration. Mm. I like the way that you're saying, hey, look, I've already won a grant. I've won a competitive competition. I just need more resources to take it further. But another thing that was missing is, I don't know where my money's going after mm -hmm. 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, 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 the passion, but you know, what is my money gonna go on? Mm -hmm. I, I have no idea, frankly. Mm -hmm. And you know, I do know uh, of much cheaper uh, and successful um, data in education uh, mm -hmm. exercises. Mm -hmm. So maybe we really need $400,000, mm -hmm. but I'm not yet convinced. Um, and the, the final thing is, I mean, in this audience, I, don't, I can't speak for the people behind me, but maybe uh, with, with me, the Coke analogy is fine, mm -hmm. but you've got to be careful about that because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people in the education space mm -hmm. when they hear children being compared to, to bottles of Coke. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know exactly what you meant, mm -hmm. but that's a, de you know, not all audiences will like that. So that's sure, a piece of sure. feedback that didn't, didn't resonate. Didn't, no, it didn't prevent me from wanting mm -hmm. to invest, mm -hmm. but it's more, more broad feedback. So um, I, I definitely want to give you the opportunity to answer those kind of accusations, but that was, that was my sense. I think accusation is a bit harsh. That was actually really, really helpful feedback. Great. Um, I think the audience, I was, you don't see the audience behind me, but there were so many heads nodding. Um, so thank you so much for that. I think, I mean, you know, speaking to the sort of just the story, I mean, I spent three and a half years living in a mud hut in rural Kenya starting my own girls' secondary boarding school and was very frustrated at the fact that all this global discourse was going around us and there was no way for us to bring our learnings onto that surface. 
and the, the, the not, 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 not in the sense of the silver bullet, but the critical difference of our school in the community and actually being one of the most successful girls' schools in Kenya was the frequency of feedback that teachers had about themselves and the frequency of feedback that they gave to the students. And more importantly, that conversation that they had with both of that information, both with their school head, but also with the parents of the students themselves. So this type of narration of the whole point of data really gets to the heart of data literacy in a sense, not only in terms of analysis and interpretation, but that storytelling, which is the qualitative need in the project of education. How do I know if I'm failing if every single year I'm waiting for another assessment? Rather, every month, every particular, I think, interaction that I potentially have in my classroom, whether I'm there or not, I want someone to care about that. And so that type of, that type of resource is not available for the majority of our teachers and school leaders. And being in a context in Kenya and doing my own PhD about the use of SMS technologies with a thousand head teachers across Kenya, I see also many of these affordable and cost-effective means of collecting data, but they can collect probably three to five questions maximum. And we are, it's, a, it's kind of a question of social justice when we're thinking about, well, we really want to equip our teachers and head teachers and parents with the ability to collect, analyze, and use data to not only track, but to actually empower and support students. For us, in the last year and a half, Salesforce and our partnership with Vera Solutions have actually broken that barrier of a technological solution that would be good enough in a developed country and workable in the developing world context where we work. So thanks for that, Hassan, I really appreciate it. Andrew, I'm sorry to cut you off, um, but we're actually literally out of time. So what I'd like to do is just have the judges quickly go down the row and say last concluding thoughts. If you'd like to give on a scale from one to five on fundability, uh, please feel free. Otherwise, uh, just, yeah, last concluding words, please. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Um, on scores, I think I'm a little bit where Hassan was. I think uh, you've, got my, you've got my heart, now you need to get my mind. Yep. Um, and, and I think we heard in the last DevEx session about the differentiation that makes a great school leader is their data, use of data-driven dis decision-making. So I have no doubt at all this is an important use of data will transform a lot of education. The bit I think you've got to take me on the journey still is the local practical applications of mm -hmm. that. You know, systems are as good as the data in and the data out. Exactly. And so who's yeah. putting it in, who's managing it, who's using it. So I think that's the, the outstanding question to, to build that story as you go forward. But well done. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Well, it's a little bit more difficult for me to think about fundability considering the fact that I'm coming from the private sector and I'm not familiar enough with how to fund uh, not-for-profit initiatives. But what I heard is a call for partnership. So uh, um, my question, which you don't have to answer now, is how can we help? Uh, besides money, I'm sure that there are lots of other resources that uh, might be interesting. And uh, in as much as I want to, I, I resonate with what the, the critique that was mentioned. Um, I, I believe that this is an ongoing process and I think that we are a leg behind in terms of data. So any structured effort, I am more than inclined to salute and I think what you are doing is great. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so I, as I said, I think um, if you came and pitched this uh, for real, that obviously uh, I would be asking questions. I wouldn't just say, right, you didn't answer that, therefore, you know, you're out of here. Right. And so I believe that you'd be able to um, uh, make this a very uh, investable pitch. And so I'll give it three out of five, but trending upwards, right. um, with the, you know, because you don't have to convince everyone in the first conversation. Exactly. Um, but getting down, even better than you did just now, in yeah. other words, really simply, two sentences. Yep. This is gonna transform kids' education because X leads to Y leads to Z. Data, yeah. and then Z is it le learning. kids learning more. Yeah. And so what's the Y? But really, really simply. Brilliant. Thank thanks. you. Great, thank you. Yeah, hey. Please join me in thanking Andrew. Thanks, Excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to um, give Amy as much time as possible. This is Amy Shocker. She's from Invincible Me. Um, I'll invite her to take the stage and tell us about her initiative.
about a year ago, I asked my eight-year-old son to tell me what makes life good for him, what makes him happy and feel safe and what he enjoys doing. This is what he drew for me. Our family of three being together, enjoying ourselves, a home filled with furniture and lots of toys, and a very unhealthy plate of food that we could all share together. So, <laughs> My name is Amy Shocker, and I am the founder of a new charity called Invincible Me. Um, my background is in education for over 20 years. I have a master's from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where I worked with some of the most inspirational educators and leaders. And for the past 13 years that I've been living in the UK, I have worked in some of the local authorities and a number of schools on strategic projects. What I have found missing, however, is any information about mental health, any sort of um, help for teachers or students around mental health. So about a year ago, I started doing some primary research, secondary research, talking to everyone I could to find out what the need was, what's already out there, and what we could do to help this problem. Uh, currently, just to get, I'm sure this audience knows quite a lot of data around this topic, but to give you some perspective, uh, currently they, the reports say that about 10% of all children and young people suffer from a diagnosable mental health issue, depression, anxiety, and stress amongst the top three. That equates to 220 million young people and children. Uh, the most common link to mental health issues later in life and other difficulties later in life is actually early childhood trauma. We call these adverse childhood experiences, and if you can read this a little bit, um, it's, it could center around abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. It's a lot more common than most of us would think when we think about trauma. Divorce, uh, a parent with mental health issues, it could be a number of things that are very common. Um, however, this affects children greatly and will affect them much more in later life. There was a 2016 U uh, report done in the UK about mental health, and some of the findings that were children that had been through childhood trauma were two times more likely to leave school without any qualifications, three times more likely to become teenage parents, four times more likely to be dependent on drugs and alcohol, six times more likely to die before they're 30, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. These are shocking statistics, and I wonder how we as change makers and influencers can let this continue. Sorry. I think it's clear that we need a profound transformation in what we're doing in education. I've spoken to so many teachers and head teachers and other educators who said our staff is not equipped to deal with what we see in schools. Mental health issues are on the rise. They've always been there and just not talked about. However, there has been a lot of evidence about severe mental health issues that are increasing in, the, in schools today. So what is Invincible Me going to do about this? What we're proposing, we're, we're a, a mental health charity that is here to, um, to help the most vulnerable children in our society, particularly those who have been through trauma. We'll do this by empowering teachers, school staff, school leaders to understand the root causes of some of these issues, to identify symptoms, and then to be able to deal more appropriately with the children in their care and refer when that becomes necessary. In an average class of 30 children, at least three are, are, have been shown to have diagnosable mental health issues, and often more. Um, there is a wonderful quote that I just read in The Guardian a few weeks ago by a deputy head teacher in the north of England. And I put it up here, if you can read it. Um, he says, mental health is everybody's business. The government needs to invest more so that we, as classroom teachers, receive proper training to deal with these issues and have the support in place when exploring the best way to move forward with a child. There's a fear of delving into mental health because of a lack of knowledge. That's why teachers need a clear structure for support. I don't know if any of you attended Michael Gove's session yesterday with Arnie Duncan, but he said that his biggest regret when he was Secretary of State was for Education was not addressing mental health in schools. So I think that was a powerful statement that it's definitely um, becoming much more in the forefront. 
Now, we believe that we can have the greatest impact by working with schools, and they can create a ripple effect. So one teacher that we train can then go on to help 10 children, 20 children. Uh, it's, it's hard to measure impact of so psychosocial programs. So what we're going to be doing is putting in place a robust evaluation around our training, as well as the outcomes for both teachers and children. Uh, we propose to do that for a year, and then we're looking to continue on a longer longitudinal study. We are going to, our, our program consists of three strands. The first is basic knowledge around mental health. As I said before, you know, this is happening a lot more now, and there are other organizations doing that. However, ours is, Invincible Me is very focused on clinical knowledge. So we have psychotherapists, um, a neuropsychologist who's helping create the content so that teachers really understand from an evidence-based perspective what, what you know, the behaviors in their classroom really mean from a medical perspective. Um, we want to empower them with knowledge so that they can go in. For, you know, unfortunately, teachers can't walk into a classroom anymore like maybe they could have you know, 20 years ago and just sort of expect all the kids in their class to learn. These kids are not in an optimal state for learning. So we want to help them do that. Secondly, we want to give them tools and techniques to address some of the issues. So what we found is, I don't know if any of you, if it's an American expression, but we always say, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So I keep thinking about that when I think about putting together this toolkit, because I think that a lot of teachers continue to teach and to interact with their children the way they always have with the pupils. Um, so we want to give them some other you know, tools and techniques. Uh, we're, going to, we're doing a lot of research with other teachers to find out what's worked, as well as from you know, mental health practitioners. We'll also signpost them to other existing organizations. We, we're not going to be all things to all people. We're very focused on what we'll do. Uh, and there are a lot of great organizations out there who can provide much more uh, intensive treatment should the, the schools deem that necessary. Thirdly, and this is a big focus for us, is on teacher well-being and coping strategies. So we, there's been a lot of evidence on how trauma, how secondary trauma affects the people providing the support. So we, we've seen high rates of absenteeism in school, burnout. Um, Brent Wigdorf from Teach First talked yesterday about you know, how teachers don't stay around for very long. And we believe that by giving them strategies to separate themselves from you know, some of the things, situations they're in and just on a daily basis um, learning how to cope with that, we can help to decrease those levels. Um, as I, I said briefly, we are looking at a one-year uh, study, and then we're hoping to maybe get some other funding to do a five-year longitudinal study. Um, I was lucky enough to talk with Professor Becky Francis from UCL yesterday, and she was very interested, and she said this is something they do a lot, so we're going to look to work with academics to create a really long-term outcome-based evaluation. Um, so I'm, I, I'm conscious of time, too, and I don't, <laughs> don't want to go on. I just want to tell you one other story. I was thinking about what success would look like. And obviously, the first thing would be, what would it look like for the teachers? So I thought about how demoralizing it must be often for teachers to walk into school and know that they had to shout at that same child, or they had to deal with the one that sits by himself on the playground, or the little girl that's always starting fights. So my vision is that teachers will feel so much more confident going in every day that they'll be able to say, you know what, I've really made a difference for that child. There's been a lot of research about the importance of, of positive relationships with adults. And a lot of the children that we'll be dealing with don't have that, don't have those role models. So we want to help these teachers to form those relationships. For the children that are having problems, they're probably tired of being yelled at. And, you know, it's not working. So to, for the teachers to then be able to interact with them in a way that works for them, we hope that they'll be happier, they'll feel that they matter, that they're being listened to, and that they can go on to learn and be really successful in life. And then I thought about something else, and what this would look like for the rest of the kids in the class. So my story is this, my, my son, who's now eight and a half, uh, is in a state school in southwest London. And we moved him there in year two, and he repeated a year because he's an August child, and it was the oldest class. It's a free school, a new free school. Uh, so we put him in there, and I was really excited. It was really small classes, and I thought he'll get lots of attention, and you know, this is really wonderful. But I didn't realize that in a class of 20, there were 11 children with statements of special needs, um, which is fine. All children need things, but that's a really high percentage in a new school in a fairly affluent area of southwest London. 
So my son is really happy at school, and he's really learning a lot, and he's flourishing, and he's made some great friends. But he's told me on numerous, t on numerous occasions how challenging it is to constantly have the teacher shout at this kid, and that there's a really smart little boy in his class who's always distracting him. So I thought, well, for my son and the other kids in the class, wouldn't that be a nice environment, a harmonious, harmonious, collaborative environment to have all of the kids in his class feel really comfortable and really supported? So that's my goal, is that all kids in every school will be able to work together and be more empathetic to their peers as well. I have a brother who's about four years older than me who lives in the States, and he's now 50. And he, um, I don't talk about him much. People that know me always used to ask me how my brother is. I say, he's fine, he's fine. And when I was, in the past year that I've been looking at this topic, I started to think about why it is that I never really wanted to talk about my brother. We are polar opposites, and that's always what I'd say, and I'd leave it at that. But what I've realized is that I think he has a serious mental health issue. I think we all knew that, but, you know, it wasn't really addressed. Interestingly, he did have a big brother from Big Brother Big Sister, so I know the organization well, but my most vivid recollection of that is, is going to a dinner at his big brother's house and them asking him to leave the table because he was being belligerent at the table. So obviously, that didn't work. So, you know, he went to child psychologists, but then I think back then my mother didn't know what to do with that, and I don't think many of his teachers supported him very well. So it makes me sad, I think, to talk about him because I feel like his life could be so much happier and more productive if he'd gotten the help he needed. So I think that was probably my, my other biggest inspiration to, to start Invincible Me. So I, I, all I want to say uh, right now is, our, is my pitch. So we've just been given a very generous uh, grant from the Varkey Foundation of $40,000, um, which we're thrilled about and very grateful for. And looking at our budget, our expected, expected cost for the first year and how we can really make an impact, we're looking for another 90000 uh, to have an operating budget of about $130,000 um, for the first year. And we are really hoping, we've had such great feedback already from people we've spoken to over this weekend, so we're looking for financial support, but also we're looking for input, we're looking for suggestions for people that might like to be on our board, help us to grow a really strong governance structure, um, and we're looking for schools that are interested in partnering with us and giving us their input. So I thank you all for your time, and I hope that together we can look to help every child create a very l <laughs> a lovely picture of home life, a, sa a safe, health, happy, healthy life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Such a good pitch that I stopped looking at the clock. So it's it's the <laughs> definition of a compliment from a moderator. <laughs> um, I want to start this time with Hassan since uh, you were last last time, um, and it would be great to get time to hear from the audience as well. So I if I can just ask all of you to be. Uh, keep that in mind with your comments and sort of try to be as concise as possible. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's hard, but I'll be concise. Is this being recorded? <laughs> it's not. I'm not sure. Okay, no. it's not. Okay, good. Then I can be I can be honest. <laughs> I think we'd like to hear from the judges first, but then afterwards, for sh definitely, okay? Yeah, so, so do you mind if we do Let's it first? Let's do the judges and first, and then we'll... Okay. Awesome, go ahead. Yeah. So I also have a brother um, like uh, yours who um, is now in the best possible situation, but it took too long and it wasn't picked up during his education. So I very much empathize with your story. And uh, I also have a free school that I founded and I sit on the board of. Uh, that, uh, and I think as, as the thing about free schools is uh, no one's ever heard of them before by right. definition because they're new. And so you often get people who are really in desperation about the educational options they have who then send their kids there. Yeah. And so we also have a very high proportion of poverty mm -hmm. and also of a special educational needs. And th there's an overlap there yeah. as well, as you yeah. know. So it's not, they're not in, uh, mutually exclusive. And um, so I, I fully sympathize with the problem uh, that you're putting out. And genuinely, uh, I would like to talk about uh, all of those things that you mentioned it's not something the Gates Foundation funds, but as the, as the school, in terms of you're looking for schools, you're looking for people to right. help you with governance, uh, let's talk afterwards. Right. However, uh, you know, again, being mean, there are a bunch of things that you didn't lay out here in this pitch that I certainly will want to understand. Okay. Uh, I don't know how long you've been going, although I think it's year one. I don't know how many staff you have. I don't know how many schools you're operating in. I don't know how many kids you're working with. And, you know, 
I, I have a lot of pitches come to me from people who are just starting out, right? And that's what you're, and that's okay. It's okay to say, look, we're just starting out. But you have to work really hard when you're just starting out to demonstrate your competence mm -hmm. in this topic. Because, you know, the Aga Khan guy, I didn't, I wasn't so mean about that because look, we've all, we know it's a hundred million dollar organization, hundreds of millions of dollar organization. Uh, you know, it, I don't want to see his bank statements. But for you, you know, who are you to be so good in this? And I'm sure the answer is, is full and, 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 and exciting, but you need that in your pitch because otherwise you've identified a problem uh, that we all agree in, Michael Gove agrees in, but I don't know why you're the person to give money to yet, but I'm sure that you are. Okay, thank you. Amy, thank you very much. Uh, we definitely felt your passion. The pathos was coming through. I think you tackled a little bit the ethos. You used your academic credentials uh, a little bit at the beginning, but also I felt mm -hmm. uh, about learning a little bit more on what recommends you to take this project mm -hmm. through. Um, my perception is that it's a seed project. You are presenting a vision rather than That's right. um, more. And maybe one idea is to, especially in a, in a venue like this, to call for ideas in a more specific manner for developing that in, in partnership. Okay. Um, um, I think that the problem is extremely important, one of the most pressing, and uh, as I said before, I think any initiative conducted by people with sharp minds and warm hearts needs to be supported. So um, again, how can we help? And let's talk more afterwards. Thank so you. congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Amy, well done. <laughs> no, not a great, um, I wouldn't want to stand in your shoes having to do this, so you did a great job. And I, as you know, the issue is incredibly important, something that the Royal Highnesses and the Royal Foundation are, are very engaged in. And certainly your um, presentation aligned with our fe findings around the scale of the issue and the fact that teachers struggle with how to deal with it. And it's interesting, had you been, I'm not sure if you were here last year at the forum, but in almost every session last year, in the way we talked about citizenship this year, Last year, it was emotional well-being oh. and, and an absolute sense that teachers right. cannot perform as well as they need to to develop educational outcomes if people aren't able to, to deal with the emotional situations that they're finding themselves in. So I think it's an idea of its time. To that point, the question I'd want to ask you is a little bit what Sam was saying, but maybe you could just help us understand why you set up a new organization. There are lots of providers. It's a relatively crowded space, actually. Mm -hmm. And so what your funding model will be and why you decided to sort of break out on your own rather than putting your energies and talents behind one of the existing providers? Shall I respond? Um, <laughs> um, so yes, I mean, to your point, Hassan, and I did, I said at the beginning, we're, we are, we're a new charity, but I probably should have said we are a startup in the traditional sense of the, of the, the phrase. Um, so we, the, the, this funding that we got is really our first step to moving forward into you know, really kind of cementing all the pieces. We, I, I've been spending a year on, of my own time talking to people and trying to figure out what the model should look like. Um, but now we, we are, uh, we're waiting for our registration number from the Charity Commission, and we are, you know, excited to start partnering and talking to more people. And, um, but I think to, to your point, Nick, um, there are a lot of people out there, and I've spoken to, to quite a few of them and to people that are involved with them. And I don't, you know, um, a lot of them are quite, first of all, a lot of them are very general. So a lot of them employ a lot of stuff. So I have no staff. <laughs> I'm the first staff, um, and it's sort of volunteer staff at the moment. But um, we, a lot of these other organizations employ counselors and people that go into schools and spend time in schools, and that's not going to be our model. Our model is very specifically teacher training. Um, and we are also primary education. So we do have quite a lot of, of structure around who it is that we don't want to be all things to all people. We want to do what we do really well. So we're looking at early childhood education, um, you know, up through primary. And um, I don't feel that from what I've understood, I think the biggest differentiators are the focus on, in everything we do, there'll be a focus on the teachers and their well-being. So a lot of organizations, your place to be, they'll offer mindfulness training for the teachers. We are going to embed it in everything we do so that when we give them tools and techniques, say, how might you deal with this better? How might this affect you? Because, you know, if they start to have really difficult conversations with these, you know, children. And if we look in areas with high refugee populations, for example, which we may well do, then that's a whole nother set 
set of, you know, and I'm not expecting them, and this was in my pitch if I'd forgot, if I'd remembered it, but <laughs> I'm not expecting them to be mental health issues. None of us are, or to be mental health experts. We're not expecting, you know, them to take on the job of CAMS in the UK, you know, the, the government funded organizations. However, those organizations are very over in demand and under resourced. And so we want them to be able to sort of triage the situation and look at what's the baseline, what they can do in the class to make things better, what they can do with maybe a day from place to be coming in and doing play therapy and which kids would benefit from that, and then who they need to really refer. And then they have a much more concrete way of referring as well. So instead of saying, oh, this kid, I don't know, I really don't know what to do with him, they can say he's really showing symptoms of you know, schizophrenia or whatnot, because I, I, from what I understand, psychotic mental illness is on the rise in young children. So, you know, they, I, and I think there's very identifiable symptoms. I'm sure the doctor could tell us more, but uh, so we, we are, you know, we're looking to partner with other organizations and, and be really collaborative, um, but we want to have our little niche. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. If I can add just um, my, my own Please. very brief feedback. Um, I think I'd love to hear actually a little bit more about the toolkit that you're offering. Um, and sure. I, I feel that actually... Um, if I can, if I can say, my generation, I think, is more and more interested in going into education. Mm -hmm. I have more and more peers who are in these difficult schools, who are sort of, you know, really um, out there day to day. And the number one thing that I've heard from them is, I don't know how to deal with these situations. Yeah. So I would love to hear, sort of, concretely, you know, what are the tools that you're offering? Again, not only <laughs> for the students, but for the teachers themselves, yeah. um, whose, you know, mental well-being I've seen from my own yeah. friends' experiences, you know, really can can be affected as well. Um, let me open up to the audience. Um, I know we have some interventions. Please, and if you could just introduce yourself briefly as well. No, no, it's yeah. Um, okay. let's Hello. Th Hello. Sorry, the, the yeah. lady here, and then I'll turn to you, doctor, okay? Hello. Hello. So if you can just wait one minute, she has the microphone, and then I'll pa we'll pass <laughs> to you next, sorry. Hello, Amy. My name's Annie Egger. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, as a mature teacher on the rock face, um, many years, I'm very concerned about my professional development. And over the last 20, 30 years, education has changed. Mm -hmm. And so one of my questions is how do you plan to include CPD into um, your program? The other one um, is assessment and evaluation. You know, Ofsted is always there. Yeah. And this is a really, really difficult subject to yeah. evaluate and assess. And um, it's not an easy question to answer, I know, so I'm sorry. But have you thought about how you're going to deal with that? Okay. So those are my questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Let's take a few more interventions, and then you can okay. um, quickly respond. You'll have to remember them. I'm not always uh, good. Sir, yeah. <laughs> if I can just ask everyone, please, again, to introduce yourself, and also to be brief, yeah. keeping in mind that we have a few uh, people to speak. Uh, Thanks. I'm Dr. Arkirai. Hello. Uh, I'm dealing the same issues. I am chief executive of Center for Training in Primal Leadership. This is a concept which has emanated from Harvard University. And we are all educationists, doctors, we are concerned what you said. Madam, this is not a small problem. I'm, I'm in agreement with you. This is a huge problem facing the whole globe. Mm -hmm. So one foundation assistance can be of very small use. What the lady has asked the question is very pertinent question. This should be a part of a national program of a country for a school teachers, so that a teacher can assess correctly the student. Not only mental disease, there are category of mental disease. For example, simple neurosis. Mm -hmm. A neurosis is not a labeled psychiatric disease, but there is a boy in the class who sits in the back, he is withdrawn, he does not take interest. That is also categorized as a for teacher as a case of depression. So, and then, post-trauma disorders. Yep. The whole world is facing. Yep. Uh, this is my view, and I will request the judges also to recommend. Thank in you. India, we have started our recommendation. The, a course has been started uh, with the school teachers throughout the globe. In America also, I understand New Haven schools, about uh, 1,200 schools they have started a program. So Thank program you. should be Thank there you. for this. Thank you. Great. Teachers. Thank you so yeah. much. A gentleman here, please. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, delighted to talk more. Toby Eccles from Social Finance in the UK. Thank you. Um, we've also been looking at mental health uh, in adolescents in the UK. I think two observations. The first is that CAMS, um, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, are 
so focused on tertiary or, or, yeah. or very, very difficult cases only yeah. that you're slightly in danger of opening things up and then not being able to close them. And the gap in service around for uh, anxiety, for mm. um, self-harm, for those kinds of things is so enormous mm. that I just think talking to people at the Wish Centre and others, and I, we can mm. think about that together, um, bef is important because otherwise you're going to be in danger of leaving children with sort of a st for an opening, uh -huh. but then with nowhere to go. Thank you. Um, that would That's be my only concern. Okay, I have a thought on that. <laughs> and uh, lastly, the, the lady here. Thank you. I'm Ruth. Uh, I work for VSO and I come from Hi. Rwanda. And uh, my question to you, Amy, thank you so much for the presentation, um, is about when we talk about education, especially with your title, Invisible Me, where are the parents? The parents for the people, for the children with mental health or children with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, how about the referrals? How are you considering the referrals? I come from a developing country. Mm -hmm. And I think in developing countries, we don't have the benefit of what mm -hmm. you have of small classes and mm -hmm. the teacher being able to identify the children that they have in their own classes. So how is the teacher being supported to have that basic knowledge of being able to identify the, the mixed abilities, the, the, the learning needs that these children have? And are females more affected that, than males? How do you compare that? Thank you. Okay. That's a really great question. So start. <laughs> yeah, let me. Um, <laughs> I know that's a lot to address in a short time, but if you yeah. can just have a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let, I'll try and remember them. You might need to remind me. But um, the CBD question first um, is a is a very good one. Thank you for, very much for asking that. Um, so we are talking to a few universities. Um, as I said, I spoke with UCL and I've spoken to the University of Roehampton. There are a few that we are looking at trying to get the course accredited once we have the course, <laughs> um, once we have all the content. Um, but we are looking at that, and, and we, we sort of are expecting to have sort of a two-prong model in terms of our entry to market, if you will. So teacher training, um, and there's a lot of big organizations like Teach First um, that do a lot of pre-training now. You know, they've increased that over the years. Um, they do a residential, they do conferences all the time. So we'd like to be involved in those. Um, and then with, with teachers who have been in the, you know, in the classroom already for however many years, um, you know, but, but didn't maybe miss that training. You know, maybe you may not have had that mental health training because as I, I think we all know, it hasn't been in the, on the agenda for very long. So I think that that is something that, you know, teachers who have been in the, the system for a long time um, would be interested in. Um, your second part about assessment, at, yes, so again, we are also talking to some universities who have really good, you know, there are uh, other programs out there that have measurement criteria in place, and as I said, psychosocial programming is a bit difficult to, to measure, especially over a, the course of a year. However, we are looking to put in place some touchstones to say, you know, at this point, have you seen a difference in the behavior? How are you feeling as a teacher? So a lot of it is going to be sort of anecdotal at first anyway. And then if we're able to line up a longitudinal study, I think that will be really interesting, kind of following some teachers and some students over the course of whatever it is, five or 10 years. Um, so we, that's a really important part. I don't think we can you know, have a program if we don't measure it and evaluate it. Um, the one thing, I mean, I can certainly talk more about the tools and things, but as I said, we want to work with experienced teachers and head teachers, and I, because I've been in education in the UK system for 13 years, I do have a lot of people, we have a head teacher on our, on our board. Um, and so we're kind of looking at things like circle time, which, you know, right now, I mean, there are organizations that go out and train exclusively on circle time, but there are a lot of things that are working, quiet spaces, things like that. And again, if, if a school is open to and has, I don't know quite how their funding works, but to work with like a place to be, I know they come in and they set up an area in the school. So again, we're not trying to do everything. Um, we really want to develop collaborative relationships with some of the bigger providers who can then help that. And I think that speaks to your question as well, um, is that, you know, I, I know a lot about, I mean, I've read a lot about CAMS and, and there have been a lot of complaints, obviously, <laughs> about the fact. So that's why I said if we can help teachers to triage, then they can identify that. And then our 
plan is really to refer to a lot of voluntary sector organizations who have mental health practitioners on staff. I'm certainly, you know, I, our recommendation would be that they get them in the queue for CAMS, but we all know that that could be a really long time. So I think that that's where we need to draw on the existing organizations that are doing great work. Amy, I'm sorry to cut you no, off. I <laughs> want to be respectful of everyone's time, the judges' <laughs> time, as well as our, our audience. Thank I know you. has places to, um, that they are off to next. So it sounds like there's a lot of great <laughs> conversations to keep going after this. Thank um, you. Please join me in thanking Amy for a great presentation. Thank and you. both our panelists, wishing them the best of luck. Thank you.